Well, good morning, everyone. I won't make you stand up and say good morning, teacher. I feel like I'm back at primary school for that. Um, so as Michael mentioned, we are just launching the joint program on resilience engineering, and it's joint in it's a partnership to begin with with Lloyd's Register Foundation and Arup, which is uh, 13,000 strong, mainly engineering consultancy, but they uh, have all the disciplines that range in front of the engineering and behind. So because I'm going first and because we're talking about resilience a lot the next couple days, I thought I'd back up. Uh, and in, instead of saying what we think resilience is, is to talk with you a little bit about why should we care about resilience. And I think once you get a sense of why you should care, it's easier to uh, absorb the kind of dry definition that we all use. So I think this is a photo of the floods in Brisbane, but it should probably look familiar to all of us because we've had flooding like this in all of our countries much more extensively than we are used to over the past five or 10 years. And one of the reasons I think that we're having the flooding, but more importantly, another part of the, the motivation for thinking about resilience concepts instead of older concepts that have served us well for a while is that the future isn't what it used to be. Now, the future never was like the past, but it was a pretty good way to start thinking about your engineering design. And certainly economists use the past um, as a place to start when we think about what's going to happen with the global economy or in a more micro level. And what we believe is that right now, the past trends and the knowledge you can gain from looking at things in the recent past from a you know, projection point of view are increasingly unreliable. We have to start to think about the future and how to design for the future using scenarios and other kinds of techniques, because regression analysis of what happened in the past is, is going to be um, misleading. And the, the, um, these trends of population, urbanization, and globalization are not only large now, they're dominant and they're accelerating. And uh, those of us who think in terms of resilience believe that's what's different. It's not that they're, you know, the globe has always been populating, it's always been urbanizing, and globalization has been the dominant trend for a few decades, but the scale is increasing. And it's important to remember that right now, the present isn't really that good for a lot of people. At least a billion people are still in deep poverty, even though we've made tremendous success at reducing um, abject poverty across the world. This is the Kibera slum in Nairobi. There are similar slums of this magnitude and size in many parts of the developing world. And you can see it lacks, you could almost see it, think it lacks infrastructure, much, much less adequate infrastructure. And as um, the global south urbanizes, an awful lot of the urbanization looks like that. It doesn't look like the urbanization patterns of um, Western Europe and North America. And we have to say that there are also existential threats at a global scale, which may have existed in the past, but we didn't have the consciousness to recognize it. Um, there's nothing more iconic or paradigmatic than the lonely polar bear on an ice floe when he's supposed to be on solid ice. The Arctic Ocean is open most summers now. That hasn't been true um, maybe since the first uh, people crossed over the, the bank to get into North America from Asia. And that has opportunities, of course, for global trade. There's a big competition up there, uh, global international competition for access to the Arctic, for passage, for minerals. Um, but it, had, it does threaten many species in the Arctic Ocean, and not least the indigenous peoples that surround the Arctic. And um, it's also important to remember, you're, uh, you know, we don't want to ignore history, we just don't want to use regression, regression to predict the future, that a lot of these challenges aren't new. So this is Machu Picchu, but there are a number of other relic cities that we could put up. And in we're increasingly sure about what caused the abandonment of some of these um, old uh, large cities, or and in some cases, the whole populations. I think uh, in Machu Picchu, they believe it was disease brought from the Europeans. Sometimes I use a slide of Tikal in Guatemala, which is the relic of a great Mayan um, uh, civilization. And the current belief is that the Mayans, uh, high Mayan classical civilization fell because they changed the local climate so much. Uh, so we've had disease, we've had other kinds of threats, climate change, all through human history, but again, this is happening at a global scale. 
And again, we, we get it, we know about it. And so it, I believe it becomes more incumbent upon us to recognize that and think about how to not have failure. We'll have change, but how to not have failure. This is an older picture from um, Johan Rockström et al., scientists around the world. And they, they're trying in this work and the subsequent work for which there's not as pretty a picture. I confess I use this one because it's got a better picture. And they're trying to define what all the major systems that keep this globe in more or less the situation that our species evolved in. So during the Holocene of the past 10,000 or 12,000 years, they're looking at what the climate was like, what the biodiversity system was like, how much nitrogen and phosphorus were available, um, what the uh, ocean acidification um, was, and, of, and a few others of these. So these aren't caps, per se, on what our species can do, but they're warning boundaries that if we get outside these uh, this safe operating space, we have no idea what will happen to humanity because we became who we are, the rise of agriculture, the rise of cities, on into the, the um, technical era that we're in today under the uh, safe operating space limits that they've identified. So maybe now you care what resilience is, I hope. And the, you know, the general term is that resilience is the capacity for a system to survive, adapt, thrive, grow in the face of chronic stresses or uh, stress from acute shocks. And sometimes, often, systems have to transform. I was speaking earlier to someone, and I admit we're, I'm guilty of promoting some of this, that we talk about resilience as if it's good often, and there is resilience we want, but there's also I sometimes call it persistence. We can end up being resilient in um, a state we don't really want, like poverty that, that's unalleviated or some of the social stresses that seem hard to get rid of. But in general, it's the capacity to, uh, to kind of deal with whatever comes your way. So if you think about what you can do about it by learning how to think in terms of resilience, resilience building, will help you prevent or mitigate against the shocks and stresses you can imagine, but even some that you can't. And I say that again, going back to these accelerated rates of change and some change in, the, in some of Earth's systems that we are going to face events and we're gonna face um, changes that we, we don't know quite how to plan for. But we have some idea what capacity we need to deal with it. Resilience also lets you take advantage, it you know, pushes you to take advantage of new opportunities in good times and in bad. So this is a new big berm being built along the Maule River in Constitución, Chile. Chile had the earthquake the same time Haiti did. Chile had far less damage than uh, Haiti did because they were prepared. They had building codes and most of the buildings were built to the code. But they still um, incurred a lot of damage. So, uh, in our field, we're starting to talk about these kinds of um, parklands along that are being built out that will take the water in the time of a tsunami or other kind of flood. And we talk about these as, as berms with benefits. So part of thinking in terms of resilience is don't invest in anything if it only does one thing. Think about what other kinds of services you're going to need and um, use your investment dollars for more than one thing. So sort of almost the opposite of Occam's razor, which I think is behind a lot of economic thinking and engineering thinking. Let's just keep it simple. The other challenge with resilience, another challenge with resilience, is that it requires, to work with it, it requires some understanding and consideration of complexity and of the interdependence of systems and services that underpin modern life. And what that means often is it's hard to think in terms of resilience if you're by yourself in your own discipline. It, it almost begs for transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary collaboration when you're looking at new challenges or opportunities. So another important question is, what increases resilience then, and, ha and how do we know? When I went to the Rockefeller Foundation five years ago now, uh, there was a lot of description about resilience, and it's pretty easy to make up a story when you look at a place that's experienced something and be able to say, well, they were more or less resilient in these ways. And then we started working on, well, 
what would we tell people to do other than generally do good inter interdisciplinary planning? Um, and that began uh, so, sort of a scientific investigation into particularly what's resilience in the context of a city or these socio-technical systems. And that work uh, is what we, that sort of mindset is how we'll continue in our joint program on resilience engineering with more of an emphasis than my old work on cities, more of an emphasis on these big critical infrastructure and other kind of critical systems. Um, as you start to think about resilience, there are a number of um, tools we've developed, those of us who work in the field. And one of the easy, one of the best ways to think about it is the every place has an exposure dimension. So you're exposed to resource stresses, water, degraded soil, um, societal stresses, which tend to be more persistent, and then the stress of acute events. So that's that horizontal dimension. But you also have uh, capacities. So in the response dimension, the vertical response dimension, these capacities that you have that are part of the capacity of resilience thinking and resilience planning, including the capacity to learn, foresight, um, and self-organization. And those become resilience multipliers. But then there are interdependencies, and particularly in our built environment and the critical, e um, critical infrastructure, that if there's too much interdependency, then these become risk and stress um, multipliers. So this doesn't tell you what to do, but I've always found it a useful lens through which to start to think about a new system that I don't know so much about, and I interrogate people who do know the system, and we sort it out this way. With my partners at Arup, which I've joined for this um, position, we developed a resilience framework. We did it first for cities, and now we're gonna see if, it's, uh, if it holds when we're thinking about other systems. Um, and so, the resilience framework has these four large categories on the outside. They are, in case it's hard to read, at the top, one, two, three, include the, the drivers of resilience, or the drivers of the condition of your city or the condition of your large power plant in terms of health and wellness. And then moving down around the clock, there's the economy and society. Um, at uh, seven, eight, and nine, we have the drivers of resilience that are related to infrastructure and ecosystems, and then finally the drivers of resilience that are related to leadership and strategy. In the context of a city, all of these drivers are critical, and uh, you can't just pick one or two and push it hard and think you're going to be more resilient, because that's, that's where that complexity comes in. You push one thing hard and you might have a surprise on the other side. Most of the people I talk to, and many of the people here, have their profession over, they, their focus over in the bottom left, um, where we've grouped together infrastructure and ecosystems, because each of those two categories, which might seem very different to you, actually do the same thing. They are either providing protective services, or they're provisioning, or they're connecting and then oftentimes they're doing more than that. So if you think of a bridge, who wants a bridge? Anybody want a bridge? <laughs> who would like to be able to always cross the bridges over the Thames? So it's a connecting service, but I think a lot of people in the field think what they do is build bridges, but they don't. They're creating connective capacity in wherever their, their client is. And increasingly, you would never build a bridge if it didn't also, in the undercarriage part, carry provisioning services like um, electrical connections and, and internet connections. So we're, you know, we're layering on these kinds of protecting, providing, and um, connecting services in our infrastructure, or we should be. So by protecting, what we talk about is we build infrastructure for protective services if in order to reduce exposure and fragility. But many ecosystems also do that. They're, they're, that's why they're, um, they're sometimes redundant, they're sometimes competing as a solution, but they do the same thing in, in this context. Or the provision services, um, obviously you're, you, know, you could be providing electricity, or you could be providing gas, or you could be providing water or um, 
uh, wastewater management capacity. Uh, yeah, because nobody here really wants a water, wastewater treatment plant either, but they want to live where there is a wastewater treatment plant that can function no matter what happens. And one of the worst outcomes, for example, of Hurricane Sandy was a lot of the wastewater treatment plants around New York City and Long Island and the suburbs are built very, very close to sea level. <clears throat> and they backed up in ugly ways. They backed up into people's houses. They backed up into their um, surrounding environment. So that's a case where that infrastructure, which is there to provide the service of handling waste, failed when there was an event that was too large for its design. Um, when we think about how we're going to use this framework in the resilience engineering program, I like to think of it as mostly we'll be working with colleagues who come in through this infrastructure and ecosystem lens, but then you go back and say, well, okay, so what does this do for the health and well-being? Um, what does it do for or what does it need from the economy and society? And what kind of leadership and strategy uh, do we need in order to be able to provide the kind of infrastructure or restore and protect the ecosystems that we look at and think are really the best way to connect, provide, or protect. And what that meant for us when we answered the call from Lloyd's Register Foundation for um, a team to lead this new idea of uh, resilience engineering is we think what that means is that we need to help to support this paradigm shift from um, preventing failure at a predefined level, which all you engineers in here are very familiar with, to designing in order to ensure functionality in diverse conditions. And that is not how most people think. We wouldn't even know how to do that now if, we, if you send somebody out to design something. A paradigm shift from thinking about risk to individual ass assets, which is the traditional disaster risk reduction, to understanding how these social technical systems like water treatment plants or the new tunnel going under the Thames for um, combined sewer overflow, how are they going to um, contribute to the safety and well-being of communities? And then finally, from understanding critical infrastructure like we're talking about, including ecosystems which can play that role, in terms of their primary function, like a bridge is to cross over the river, but to think of it even more in terms of protecting, providing, connecting, and doing as much of that as possible. So that's, we call that a paradigm shift because we're trying to start where people think, and then in the program we'll be working with um, people, everybody who wants to contribute from around the world if it works, to figure out, okay, well, how does that really work? What would we do? What would our jo jobs be? like in five years if we're successful. And just some of the indicators we're looking for or outcomes we're looking for that we see the adoption of dynamic performance-based design as the guide, guidelines for broad practice in the um, architecture, engineering, design fields. Dynamic because the climate's not stationary anymore. We can't design features, built features in the environment as if the climate's gonna be like it was in the past and we don't know exactly where it's going so you might want to think about designing in ways that the feature is adaptable over the decades, um, either of their commercial life or their useful life. And that is something that most designers haven't been called upon to do so far. Um, we think we'll need to see a broad adoption of place-based integrated systems approaches for major engineering. Um, look at beyond the footprint and more into um, its role and how it's going to affect the larger um, social technical system, which could be a city or it could be uh, someplace outside the city. Clearly, we need new tools and processes for knowing how to value resilience. Um, one thing I'm hoping to get through is thinking through the difference between real value engineering and resilience value engineering so it makes sense to people in practice. The integration of this systems thinking and resilience concepts into engineering education broadly. And then we think about the emergence of transformative technologies, and it's been very exciting for me here to, to hear about some of these coming through. But we want the ones that facilitate this critical system functionality, predictive, observational, recovery. And that's it. I think I stayed within my time. Questions? Yes, over here. 
Um, I just had a question about interdependence. You mentioned it as a risk multiplier, but within the context of resilience engineering, could it possibly be leveraged to a resilience multiplier? I think the answer to that is, of course, it, what, what it takes is thinking about, thinking about it so it doesn't become um, a risk multiplier, and instead you're um, creating some interdependence, and often you, what, you want to be able to island as well as to connect. And again, this is where technology can make a, a huge difference. It's clearest for me to think about it in the context of electricity. I think in the UK, but certainly in the US, we're looking at distributed power. And those, if that's going to really contribute to resilience, then we're going to need to decouple it and island it when we have to and interconnect it to the grid when we don't. So that's certainly they can be at both end. I'm Chad Stadden from the University of the West of England. Thanks for your uh, presentation. And I, I love the, the thought that ecosystems are infrastructure. Infrastructure is ecosystems. Mm -hmm. But it tugs on a question and a challenge, which is coming up with design guidance and uh, quality assurance processes for nature-based solutions. In the case of floods, we, we know how to design traditional solutions, and we know what the quality assurance mechanisms are for those solutions. But I think it's less clear with nature-based solutions. I agree with you totally. It's less clear, but it's not unknown. So what we hope is that over the next five to 10 years, but not waiting to the end point, we can start to um, get the same kind of design and, and um, evaluation parameters for the mixed nature-based, um, natural nature-based, uh, green, gray, that so we start to create those. And I, we all accept that it's more complex than the hard structures that we've been working with for a long time, but that's not a reason not to try to do it. Uh, so I'm working on a project now where we hope we can do this with the Corps of Engineers and the state of Louisiana for the restoration of the Gulf Coast along um, the outlet of the Mississippi River. I think we just have to start doing it and put more money into uh, designing under different scenarios and identifying what would be the parameters that you would need to keep track of. So I think this is one of the most exciting areas we face in the next five to 10 years. I'm Tom Appleby. I'm from the University of the West of England as well. Um, <coughs> I really, I loved your presentation. I thought it was brilliant. Thank you. Um, but the, the, one of the, the points that, that we've come across is, uh, I'm a lawyer, so uh, one of the, 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 the interface between the law and resilience engineering yeah. is really interesting because sometimes the law gets in the way. And I'm, I'm, I'd be interested to hear from your Louisiana experience because on the Seven Estuary where we're based, we've got a habitats, well, we've got, we've got um, nature conservation designated sites which designate grazing rights right on the banks of the river. So the cattle come along and they eat the riverbanks. They, they eat anything that kind of binds the riverbanks together. And the river's, the river's moving at three metres a year. How, do you, how can you interface with the legal system when you come up with a, a resilient, resilience engineering concept and the legal system just says, well, you can't do that? We do, of course, have the same situation in the US, which I'm more familiar with. And I think compared to the work I've done in developing countries, UK and US, our, our legal systems are clearer and they're more binding, and in some ways, therefore, more difficult to change. But they will have to change, um, along with a couple of things, first of all. There are, there are those I've been in touch with talking about from the financial services side and insurance side that there's an increasing notion of um, a duty of care that's not being met by communities, mayors, larger regions, because they're not planning for climate change effects. I think that might be a potential way to start driving change in the planning boards. I'm not, just not sure how it works here, but it, it is an idea. And I, in many ways, hope no one brings that suit soon, but they talk about it for a while to give to give the legal system and institutional system a chance to, to wake up and say, oh. And then there's the, um, you know, the physical change. So they can protect their grazing rights, but they're losing it at three meters a year. You know, wouldn't they want to compromise and work with someone so that they have grazing where it belongs and are working with the water resources boards and the others to protect the river and give it a place to move either during events or permanently, which many of these estuaries are trying to do. And the answer, the reason Louisiana's ahead of this, not a sentence you hear very often, Louisiana ahead of anything, um, is 
they're in extremists. We are, you know, uh, Thomas Jefferson b made the Louisiana Purchase, which if you're American, you learn about all through school. It added a third to the area of the United States. He did that, he bought it from the French for the port of New Orleans. And the port of New Orleans and the other small ports along the lower stretches of the Mississippi River are uh, some, of, some of the biggest ports in the world and certainly in the United States in terms of bulk. The erosion from the Gulf side uh, combined with the lack of sediment getting down into the delta means that we are actually at risk soon of losing the entire intracoastal waterway. And then shipping and the supportive services for the oil and gas industry are all going to be working in open water. But it would be a tremendous economic loss to the United States to lose the southern intracoastal waterway like we have the one on the east coast among many other reasons. You know, just indigenous people, there's unique cultures, et cetera. So I think it just got so bad that they made a master plan that was accepted by the legislature unanimously, nothing like that ever happens. And then they get the regular money from the federal government through the Corps of Engineers and a huge influx of money from the oil spill restoration money, which is giving us a head start at getting going. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, thank you.